Hello, everybody. I am once again your co-host, Trey Eidecker. I'm a professor of genetics at UC San Diego. Uh, today is day two of the machine learning workshop. Yesterday was great fun. I have no reason to believe any uh, less of today's event. Just a couple of reminders before we, we kick off uh, session three of, of today's workshop. First of all, we had a lot of participants online uh, yesterday, at some point exceeding 1,000 attendees. If and when we reach 1,000 attendees today, what happens is uh, any additional uh, people who sign up and, and join the 1,000 and first essentially begin to join not on Zoom, but in the live stream event on, on YouTube. So don't be surprised by that. In terms of yesterday's presentations, we've had a lot of requests for them. The PDFs are posted uh, uh, of yesterday's presentations on the website today. As we go throughout the day today, PDFs will appear piecemeal as sessions go on. So please look for those. In terms of video recordings of the presentations of all of the, the presenters, we are also going to release those sessions, including the Q&A sessions, but that'll take a few days. So please be patient. It, it will appear. Uh, for those of us on Zoom, unfortunately not, not on YouTube, but on Zoom, you're more than welcome and encouraged to ask questions using your Q&A link. And I think anyone who attended the workshop here uh, uh, yesterday uh, sees the lively discussion that, that can, can uh, you know, uh, it is engendered by that. So please do avail yourself of the Q&A link. And finally, a closed captioning link is also uh, available and will be shortly provided in the chat if it has not been already. Uh, it has not been already, so uh, please look for that relatively soon. So with that, I will turn it over to my co-chair, Mark Craven. Good day, everyone. I'm Mark Craven. I'm, as Trey said, co-chair of the workshop, so welcome back to day two. I'm a professor of biostatistics and medical informatics at the University of Wisconsin, and also along with Trey and others serve on the, the data science working group for the NHGRI. So we had, we had a great day yesterday. Maybe it would be good just to, to highlight the, the goals for the workshop, which I think are threefold. So one is to identify the unique opportunities and obstacles for applying machine learning in genomics, ranging from basic science to clinical applications of genomics. I think another is to identify the key scientific topics in genomics that can benefit from machine learning. And then the third is to help try to define the unique role of the NHGRI at the confluence of genomics and machine learning. So we'll just kind of keep those in mind as we go through the day. And there will be a, a wrap up sub session at the end of the day, we'll, we'll come back and, and revisit um, how the talks have reflected on, on those goals. So the, the format of the sessions today is gonna to be like yesterday, where we will have talks by stellar speakers. After each talk, there will be five minutes of Q&A that will be specifically addressed to the speaker who just presented. And then after the set of talks in each session, there will be 30 minutes for a broader ranging Q&A. And, um, and those of you on Zoom have a Q&A box at the bottom of your screen. You can use that to, to input questions. I know yesterday we had many more questions than could be addressed in the, the actual session, but please uh, contribute those questions generously. And I know they're all being logged and will be considered by, um, by the NHGRI. So without further ado, I think we can start our first session and um, the, the co-moderator for that will be Christina Leslie, who will introduce our first speaker. Hi, everyone. I'm Christina Leslie. I'm a member of the Computational and Systems Biology Program at Memorial Sloan Kettering Cancer Center. Um, I'm very excited to uh, uh, co-moderate this session three on data and resource needs for machine learning in genomics. And uh, we have uh, uh, amazing lineup of people truly at the forefront of genomics. Our first speaker is Alexis Battle, uh, who is an associate professor of biomedical engineering at Johns Hopkins University. 
Hi everyone, my name is Alexis Battle and I'm from Johns Hopkins University. Today I'm going to give you a little bit of an introduction and background into the work that my lab does more broadly before I go into a bit of a deep dive on our work on understanding rare genetic variation and ends with some more general thoughts relevant to the use of machine learning and genomics. So one of the major goals of my lab is to understand the effects of genetic variation specifically on gene expression and how that then goes on to impact high level phenotypes such as disease. And we are a purely computational lab, so much of our work is on methods development to achieve these goals. So one of the complications that we face is that there are many factors that actually modulate regulatory genetic effects. There's not really just one effect of a given genetic variant, but it can be in fact very context specific. And different aspects of, of biology can modify the effects of genetic variation, including differentiation and development, leading of course to cell type specificity. Also environmental response and sex specificity have effects that we observe as well. And, and disease is actually affected by many of these specific contexts. And to, in order to address this, we therefore need both tailored data to represent these different contexts and possible effects and methods development that can use such data. Now, one data set that I will highlight um, in, this, in this discussion is data from the GTEx project, which our lab helped uh, lead over the past few years. And GTEx's goal was really to understand the tissue specific effects of genetic regulation of gene expression. To do so, we collected this very large data set that includes almost a thousand individuals with RNA sequencing across over 50 different tissues of the human body, now paired with whole genome sequencing of these individuals. And this very large data set allowed GTEx to run both cis and trans EQTL detection in each tissue, which ultimately then provides just this huge catalog of EQTLs that can reveal the effects of individual genetic variants on gene regulation and all of these different tissues, and ultimately then to intersect these effects with disease to try to understand downstream impact on phenotype. Now, one thing that I'd like to highlight about the GTEx project and other very large scale data collection efforts is that it has led to dozens of creative projects coming out of GTEx within the consortium and outside of the consortium going well beyond the original goals of EQTL detection. And this is true for many other large scale data sets, you know, some of which I've worked on, such as the depression genes and networks data, but you know, many, many others such as ENCODE, Roadmap Epigenomics and others that have gone on to enable really creative and interesting work well beyond their original goals. As a highlight of just a few of the diverse things that my lab is interested in right now, before I get to the deep dive, what we are really thinking about is how do we combine machine learning's methods, machine learning methods development with very diverse and often context specific transcriptomic data in order to understand the effects of genetic variation. So currently some of the highlights I'll point out are an interest in single cell and dynamic EQTL models, context specificity more broadly going beyond just cell type specificity, um, work to then integrate the effects that we find on the transcriptome with GWAS and other disease study in this multi-omic integrative analysis and large scale network in, uh, inference and integration with disease. But for today, I'm gonna go into a bit of a deeper discussion about our applications of machine learning for understanding rare genetic variation. So why are we working on this? Well, our motivation is that rare variation is very abundant in the population. So for example, an individual genome is going to have on average somewhere around 50,000 rare genetic variants where rare here is defined as below a minor allele frequency of 0.01. And furthermore, in aggregate, we do know that lots of evidence suggests that rare variants are enriched for deleterious properties and that they actually do contribute significantly to both rare and complex disorders. However, evaluating the impact of any given rare genetic variant from whole genome sequencing remains challenging. Of course, if they're too rare, they cannot be assessed by association studies and predicting their consequences can be very challenging. Um, approximately half of rare disease patients, for example, go undiagnosed with current approaches. So the goals of this project were to explore the impact of rare regulatory variation 
and specifically to explore the complex of uh, complex effects of rare non-coding and regulatory variants as we see from RNA sequencing data to provide evidence of their effects. Um, and then ultimately to develop an integrative machine learning model to prioritize rare regulatory variants from personal genomes uh, supplemented by RNA sequencing data. So this was a project that did come out of GTEx. Um, this was not a project that we originally planned when we joined the GTEx consortium. It was not a project that we proposed you know, as part of any of the grants we submitted or anything like that originally. Um, but once we could see the utility of, of looking at whole genome sequencing in combination with RNA sequencing in the GTEx project, it was um, a big focus of our work there. And here, what we focused on was 714 individuals of European ancestry for whom we had both whole genome sequencing and RNA sequencing again across multiple different tissues. So how do we use RNA-seq to help prioritize functional rare variants? Well, the hypothesis that we begin with is very simple, that a functional variant, regardless of its allele frequency and regardless of whether it's coding or non-coding, will cause some sort of disruption at at a tissue and cellular level, in addition to any consequence to disease. And specifically, rare regulatory variation, we think, should often result in unusual expression of genes near those variants, likely acting in cysts. Um, but that a very you know, large effect rare variant should have some, uh, if it's regulatory, should have some large observable consequence in uh, gene expression. So the simple approach that we took to begin with is to identify individuals whose gene expression is very far from the population average. So we defined a class of individuals that we call outliers. These, and here I'm showing total expression outliers. And to define these, what we do is begin with a large population such as GTEx, where we can estimate the normal distribution of gene expression, this is for you know, one specific gene at a time, we just build a distribution of what gene expression normally looks like for, for an individual. And we then can identify individuals who are very different from the rest of the population. And here we're just showing individuals who have a z-score that exceeds some particular threshold that we can define. Um, and those will be our outlier individuals. And we and others have used this basic idea in several analyses now listed here on the right. Going beyond just total expression, however, there's a lot more information available to us in RNA sequencing. And one thing that we can look at in specific is alternative splicing. And we do know from many previous studies that both rare and common genetic variants that affect splicing have been implicated in disease. And again, both rare and common diseases. But abnormal total gene expression was, was sort of simple to describe here, you either go up or down and you may go too far up or too far down and that makes you an outlier. But how does that translate to quantifying who is an outlier or who is unusual um, for, for splicing? So if you have a gene with many different possible exons and many different possible splice junctions, we're talking a multi, about a multi-dimensional space where an individual may be an outlier. And how do we really define that? So this is a challenge that we had been looking at. And a student from our lab, Ben Strober, developed a method called SPOT, splicing outlier detection, that can, in fact, um, address this. So what he does is to, again, think about our population of individuals, such as the 700 people that we have from GTEx. You can build a matrix that describes the um, how often they use different splice junctions based on quantification here from leaf cutter. And from that, we can again estimate a distribution of what the population normally looks like. And here, instead of just a univariate Gaussian, it is a multivariate distribution. Here he's using a Dirichlet multinomial that he then can estimate the parameters of from our population of individuals in GTEx. So he can actually estimate all the parameters and learn them directly from our observed quantification of the GTEx individuals to build this distribution of what splicing normally looks like in our population. Now, if you have a new individual, you can then take that learned distribution and compare them to it and figure out how far away they are in multi-dimensional space using the Mahalanobis distance. And what I'm showing at the bottom here is an example of an individual who is detected to be an outlier based on spot. The pink individual is an outlier. The black individual is an inlier who's very close to the population average. And you can see, for example, 
that this individual seems to, the outlier individual seems to retain a piece of intron that the normal individuals do not. And that would be hard to predefine. It's really not just going up or down in expression. It's really displaying an unusual pattern and we need to be able to quantify exactly how unusual is that. Okay, so with spot then, and this idea of over and under expression outliers, we're able to investigate how often these individuals also have distinct classes of rare genetic variants that may then explain their unusual transcriptomic behavior. And now we have multiple different ways of looking at it. So the four different plots here are four different categories of outliers. We have our overexpression outliers or our over E outliers, our underexpression outliers. We have allele specific expression outliers and we have splicing outliers. And you can see just at a very high level that that the categories of rare genetic variants that coincide with these different outlier individuals are in fact quite different and illuminating as to their function. So for example, you can see just from the red <laughs> that uh, on the top left that our overexpression outliers often, can, often coincide with um, genetic variants that are duplicates or copy number variants and things like that. Whereas our underexpression outliers often have deletions um, or frame shift variants that may cause extreme underexpression. And then our splicing outliers look very distinct from either of these. We're not seeing a lot of structural variants, but what we see most starkly is just a large enrichment, especially for the extreme splicing outliers for individuals having a nearby variant in one of the splice acceptor or donor sites or very nearby those. In addition, in yellow here, some evident enrichment of just other coding variants for these individuals. So we wanted to take these observations and actually integrate them into a machine learning framework that could be used for personal genomics. So our goals here are not new. It's to take an individual's whole genome sequence and all the variants that are identified from their whole genome sequencing in combination with features derived from those variants and, use, and, and build a model that can then predict from that information which of those variants are most likely to have functional impact for that individual. And there have been many models that have attempted to do this, including models that many of you have probably used, such as CAD, but a, a large suite of models in, in ongoing development. Um, and these take advantage, again, of some of the really large scale data sets that have become available now, such as roadmap epigenomics and ENCODE and others. Uh, they use features such as conservation, known transcription fa factor binding sites, and things like this. I do want to highlight that these data that I'm mentioning that they use as features about the genome are general properties of the genome in those regions and are not personalized to the individual whose genome we're evaluating. But, and we wanted to do something slightly different. So these models um, do a really nice job of building as, you know, all sorts of different predictors based on this data. But what we wanted to ask was, can we supplement that with other personal functional molecular data? Again, going back to our original hypothesis that a rare variant that might impact somebody's health should also have a molecular signature in that specific affected person. And so how far can we get by taking personal transcriptomic data and incorporating that into our predictor to build a, hopefully a better model that can predict again, which variants from their personal genome are likely to have large effects. And that's exactly what we did. So Ben Strober developed a model called Watershed that integrates multiple different molecular signals together to try to make this prediction. So the different layers of this uh, probabilistic model that we've built include G, which represent genomic features of the rare variant that we are attempting to evaluate. Again, this could be conservation scores, regulatory element annotations, and things like this. And E is also observed. E is the signal that is derived from the molecular phenotype, such as RNA sequencing. Now, the key part of the model is, of course, these latent variables, which are actually the thing we care about, which is whether or not our variant in question has a regulatory effect. Um, now, we do not, we assume that we don't observe this. So we are going to try to predict the values of these variables Z, given our genomic information and our signals from our molecular phenotype. Now, we have multiple of these E variables representing that we may have multiple molecular phenotypes such as expression and methylation, or in our case, expression, splicing, and allele-specific expression, or also in GTEx, multiple different tissues. So each one of these 
we can incorporate as a separate molecular signal E here. And watershed is very directly and easily extensible to incorporate any molecular signal that you may have um, and, and other different data types beyond RNA sequencing as well. Now, beyond being hopefully advantageous because it's this integrative model that includes you know, both whole genome sequencing and RNA sequencing or other functional data, Watershed has a few other nice properties that I want to point out. So one of them, and I think this is important um, generally in genomics, is that it is trained in an unsupervised manner. So again, we assume that these latent variables Z of whether a rare variant actually has impact are completely unobserved during training and testing. If, you know, during training is important because that means that we don't have to go out and attempt to collect a large and unbiased uh, set of training data that can tell us whether a given rare variant has impact or not. And this is something that has been historically quite challenging for other methods that have been developed is that just, you know, we don't have a huge set of variants that are known to be functional and variants that are, that are not functional. It's also very efficient to optimize and apply. Uh, we optimize model parameters here using expectation maximization. Um, our middle layer here is actually a icing conditional random field. If you have a very high dimension for T, there are approximate inference methods that we provide that will still make it um, efficient and applicable in your data. And then at the end, the train model can give us a posterior probability of impact for any rare variant that you're evaluating, given whatever data you've observed in your new patient or new individual. And it can give you that posterior probability given G, given G and E, et cetera, whatever data that you have available. Now, what we observe is that the inclusion of, of signal from RNA sequencing allows Watershed to, to have a very large improvement in prediction of which variants are functional over using only annotations from the genome alone. So this would be comparable, like our model here that I show in red, we call GAM or genome basically genome annotation model. That excludes information from RNA sequencing. Blue is our watershed model, which includes that information from RNA sequencing. And you can see that in each of these precision recall curves, we get a large boost in improvements, uh, an improvement by using that signal from RNA. Um, and this is actually replicated even if we make predictions in completely independent data outside of GTEx, which we've done in a few different data sets. And several variants we then went on actually to validate with CRISPR-Cas9 and saw that the watershed predictions in general uh, did hold up for, for the most highly likely um, variants estimated by watershed to have a functional impact. So if you take the class of variants that watershed predicts to have the most likely to have functional impact uh, and compare it to the same number of variants from a genome only model, our GAM model, Watershed really dramatically improves identification of rare variants that have, an, have a very high absolute risk of functional impact, again, by evaluating their impact on the transcriptome in held out individuals. So the, the variants that Watershed predicts to have a high impact are very quite likely to actually have that impact, whereas the genome um, alone model in general cannot predict with that level of accuracy. So the conclusions that I'd like you to take from this are that rare genetic variants do in fact often co coincide with large transcriptomic changes, giving us access to the effects of rare regulatory variants and not just rare coding variants, and that our integrative model watershed, which uses diverse signals from RNA-seq and is extensible to all sorts of other data types, provides a really large improvement in rare variant prioritization using only whole genome sequencing alone. If you're interested in reading more, uh, our paper is posted here, and the software for both Spot and Watershed are available on GitHub. I did want to end with some more general parting thoughts on enabling machine learning in genomics. I think I've highlighted already that I think key resources and opportunities include these large data sets that can, en can enable diverse creative applications beyond the original conception of the data itself. Um, one thing I really want to highlight is making those data sets easily accessible by researchers, you know, even outside the original consortia and things like that. Um, we, of course, need, you know, a diversity of data types to highlight different sorts of genomic impact. We need flexible computational resources with an increasing interest in cloud computing, of course. And we need tools and software, not just sort of finalized tools, 
but also powerful frameworks that enable people to develop machine learning methods from machine from deep learning, probabilistic modeling, and you know traditional ML. So frameworks that enable development of machine learning methods, I think, are really valuable. Some challenges that I'd like to highlight uh, include the impact of confounders and technical artifacts in these data. You know, even the most clean data sets do have have some technical variability in them. So the collection and annotation of these data sets with really extensive metadata is critical. And that was really important to our work in GTEx and in depression genes and networks. And some things that are a little bit you know, different from just thinking about resources of data and computing is you know, how do we train researchers in this highly interdisciplinary area where they need to know both you know, stats and computer science and biology and genetics? You know, how, do we, how do we accomplish that? Um, and one thing definitely I want to highlight is the need for investment in vetting, maintaining, and really coming up with really high quality computational tools from academia, you know, which is very different from software development in industry. Um, and really, how do we incentivize people to do that in a positive way and make sure that the computational tools that are available are really high quality. And with that, I just want to thank all the members of my lab, particularly highlighting here the work of Ben Strober and all of my collaborators that were involved in the work as well, and the GTEx consortium especially. And thank you very much for your time. Thanks, Alexis, for that uh, great talk. Um, so uh, we have some questions for uh, uh, Dr. Battle in, uh, in the q and I, I think the, the most important thing to address is just sort of the, there are technical questions about the, the watershed model itself and what's the dimension of the variable G and what are, you know, what um, precisely is, are, are you modeling? Um, are, is every um, locus modeled together or is it sort of one effect at a time? When... Yeah, that's a good question. So, um... The model is applied to every variant separately, but the parameters of the model are trained jointly across all, all variants. But if you're applying it, you're applying it to a particular locus at a time, if that makes sense. So the parameters of the regression from genomic annotation to whether or not a variant is functional will tell you things like, how important is it if the variant is a you know, known NMD variant? How important is it if it's in a known regulatory element or, or conserved? So the G features are features about the genome, like conservation scores and things like that. And the parameters are trained jointly across all loci, but then when you apply it, you're applying it to a particular locus at a time. Okay, there, there was a question about sample size requirements for the watershed model. Yeah, so actually there aren't that many parameters in the watershed model. So you can restrict G to, a, you know, I don't know, about 50 relevant genomic annotations and then the, the model from Z to E is actually you know, only like a dozen parameters. So the, the parameter size is actually quite small. So you don't need a huge sample size, but you do need a decent sample size in order to estimate who is an outlier for a gene. So you do need to build a good distribution of what normal gene expression or normal gene splicing or normal allelic balance looks like. And in our original application of a similar method, we had about 100 individuals and found that that was successful. Um, I think that that's a reasonable sample size to build a good distribution, but you know, now with GTEx, we have about a thousand individuals. But yeah, I think you know, less than a hundred and it's getting a little questionable. So, so there was, there's a sort of uh, more open-ended question uh, that seems popular. Um, uh, the, the question is, I wonder how many of these rare variants that are within active regulatory regions in development and, and are not in adult tissue. Maybe you have variants that show no functional impact in an adult tissue, but actually do play a role in development. And, and um, you know, the, the question goes on to ask you uh, involve a taxi chromatin accessibility data in your prediction. Absolutely. So, you know, one of the big interests of my lab is looking at context specificity, and one of those does in our lab include. Um, looking at expression during development and differentiation, which is simply not accessible if you look at adult tissue. So, you know, this model is going to be based on whatever data is available. So if you would like to apply it to a context that is very highly specialized, you need data to do so. And that is a limitation, of course. Um, so if you're basing it on the GTEx samples or, or, you know, we actually base some of our um, 
reference distributions on the recount data, which has you know tens of thousands of RNA seq samples, but most of them are adult tissue or cell lines. If you're really interested in a very specific context, you know you need data that represents that, and I do think that's very important. There's also a, a question asking if watershed meets causal modeling requirements, or is it just a prediction tool? It's just a prediction tool, I guess I would say, is that you know, what goes into it is the assumption that genetic variation is causal. It, it, does, not, it does not build it into the model. It's just assumed. Good question, though. OK, I mean, this is. Um in the context of your talk. So uh, I'm wondering what your perspective is on the evolving landscape of how we deal with confounding factors in large scale data. Are there new approaches to mitigate this um, or still reinventing the wheel? Is there viable progress to standardization? That's a good question. And, you know, I did highlight confounding factors is one of the points that I think we always need to consider when we evaluate data like this. Um, I think there are good tools out there. You know, we found that applying tools that have existed for nearly a decade now, like PEER or SVA, or even just simply PCA for these large scale data sets are quite successful in accounting for a lot of the technical variability. But I do think that it's really, really important that as we collect these large data sets that we annotate them with anything that we know, you know, depth, RIN, of course you can derive, but you know, things like batch and all of that is really important to account for. But I don't think that it's necessarily a methods development question as much as it is like when you're actually applying these models, you just need to be cognizant of it and actually make sure you do apply them. Mark, what's your call? Should we move to the next talk or? or I see a quick question if I could address oh, that Trey no, asked in the it. chat that he asked um, about how models like watershed could be used in a clinical setting. And I do want to note that we are, in fact, applying watershed to try to help diagnose rare disease individuals who, you know, they come in, they have what looks like a genetic disorder, and they've gone undiagnosed with exome sequencing and standard tools. We are trying to use watershed, collect RNA sequencing for these rare disease patients, and try to identify regulatory variants that might be causal that are missed by exome sequencing. So that's absolutely in progress. And I think you know, many people are interested in using RNA for rare disease diagnosis, and hopefully tools like this will help. Mm -hmm. What, what so the RNA context, Sorry. I'm sorry? In that context, how do you decide where the RNA expression should be collected? Well, mostly we don't have a choice, right? So you're not going to get brain tissue from most of your individuals, for example. So generally, we're talking about blood or maybe skin. So we get can get fibroblasts long term. I think that we can talk about applying you know, innovative technologies where we can actually get iPSCs from the fibroblasts and can induce different cell types. But at the moment, you know, we're largely restricted to what's available, which is usually blood. OK, I, I know that the next talk is a bit long. So <laughs> I think we, we should perhaps move on. Um, Thanks so much for, and, and we'll have more time to, to ask questions in the, the uh, joint session. Right. Thanks for a great talk. So our next speaker is Anshul Kandaje, who is an assistant professor of both genetics and computer science at Stanford University. Hi, everyone. I want to just start by thanking NHGRI for this opportunity to present to you today. Um, I'll be talking to you about how we can use machine learning approaches for uh, discovering novel biology, uh, particularly in the context of genomics. Um, as you know, machine learning models have been um, really optimized for prediction in most domains. Uh, but in, in the domains we are interested in, particularly genomics and biology, uh, we would like to use these models to understand how they're able to make these interesting discoveries. Uh, maybe if we're able to dissect these models we can learn um, novel insights about genome biology. And that's what I'm gonna focus my talk on today. So uh, as a case study, I'm gonna focus on the problem of decoding regulatory DNA. As you know, uh, genes are activated and repressed in a highly context specific manner. And this happens typically through a variety of different uh, regulatory elements that are encoded in the genome. Uh, these regulatory elements are typically recognized by a variety of protein DNA complexes, such as transcription factors, many of which have very specific uh, preferences uh, for DNA uh, sequence motifs. And um, 
a lot of efforts have been spent on characterizing the DNA sequence specificity of these transcription factors. However, regulatory elements have evolved to actually contain uh, complex syntax and grammar, um, which essentially directs uh, the precise combinations of proteins that bind each of these sites in different cellular contexts. And this higher order syntax or grammar of regulatory DNA has remained quite elusive. And so today I'm going to show you how we can use uh, what are uh, supposedly black box uh, predictive models uh, to discover um, interesting insights into regulatory grammar and syntax. And before I do that, I just want to clarify what I mean by regulatory grammar or syntax. I'm talking about the higher order rules of motif composition, uh, the affinity of each of these motifs. Uh, they are specific arrangements, which include spacing constraints, orientation, and how all of these syntax rules drive cooperative binding. So that's going to be the focus, the case study of the talk today. Now, uh, due to the sequencing uh, revolution that we've had over the last uh, two decades, um, we've seen amazing improvements in our ability to profile regulatory activity of entire genomes. So we can now perform all, all kinds of experiments, uh, you know, uh, chip seek experiments and uh, chromatin accessibility experiments and so forth, which can give us really high resolution uh, maps of various kinds of regulatory biomarkers, in this case, <clears throat> protein DNA binding sites, various kinds of histone modifications, other kinds of epigenetic marks across the entire genome in hundreds of cell types and tissues. And the NIH and NIGRI have in fact funded several large consortia to accomplish this at scale. So um, I've had the privilege of working with the ENCODE consortium and the Roadmap Epigenomics project for several years. And uh, these projects have enabled a pretty comprehensive mapping of various kinds of molecular readouts, such as gene expression, chromatin accessibility, histone modifications, uh, protein DNA binding maps, and DNA methylation and so forth across the entire genome in hundreds and thousands of cell types, tissues, and now also across individuals. And of course, now with the um, new revolution in single cell uh, profiling techniques, uh, this access has expanded even further to be able to do these kinds of measurements in single cells. So these large scale data sets are an amazing opportunity to start discovering novel insights about how the genome encodes this diversity of function. And machine learning models are an ideal tool to do this, as I'll show you, uh, because they can not only learn from large scale data sets, but uh, given the right tools, we can also interpret these models to decode um, regulatory DNA sequences and to use the models to prioritize functional genetic variants and mutations. So I want to start by sort of briefly going over how we can uh, take these large scale data sets and convert them into a classical machine learning problem. So if you perform a, a sequencing experiment, uh, let's say profiling protein DNA binding in a specific cell type, um, you get a beautiful readout of coverage, sequencing coverage um, across the entire genome. So the way you can think about it is if you take the whole genome and let's say the human genome, which is 3 billion base pairs, uh, each bin in the genome, let's say a 100 base pair bin, centered at every nucleotide in the genome, uh, essentially gets a mapping to some uh, readout from the experiment, right? So what we can do is think of this as a, a translation problem where you're given uh, a sequence of the genome and your goal is to learn a model that can take this sequence and translate it to these, um, these profiles coming out of the experimental assay. And so what we've recently done uh, in collaboration with Ziga Abchek and Julia Zeitlinger is we built a new kind of model called a, called a BPNet model. It is a neural network or a deep learning model. Uh, think of it like a text to speech converter. What it's able to do is walk across the genome and take uh, chunks of sequence and learn a predictive mapping from the raw sequence to single base pair resolution uh, profiles of any regulatory assay. 
And uh, the basic idea behind a neural network is it is essentially a complex pattern detection engine. Um, each of these layers of the neural network, they learn uh, patterns with increasing complexity. Uh, when our inputs are DNA sequences, these neural networks end up learning uh, sequence motif-like patterns. And as you add more layers to the network, uh, the network learns hierarchically more complex patterns, <clears throat> thereby potentially learning interesting um, uh, DNA uh, syntax and grammars. And ultimately the model transduces those sequence patterns into profiles. It's a similar concept to how you have text-to-speech converters um, that are very popular in other domains. Now, what's pretty amazing is that these models uh, are in fact able to make incredibly accurate predictions just from raw sequence. So I'm showing you your um, um, <clears throat> predictions from BPNet models trained on different kinds of data. Chip EXO, which is high resolution protein DNA binding assays, chip seq for transcription factors, and DNA seq, attack seq, and even pseudo bulk single cell attack seq data sets, uh, which, which measure chromatin accessibility. And um, in each case, what I'm showing you is predictions of the models on sequences, uh, entire chromosomes that it has never actually seen before in training. So we hold out some part of the, of the genome, we train on one part and we see if the model can generalize its predictions to <clears throat> sequences it has not seen before. And here you can see, uh, when you see OBS, that's the observed data from the actual experiment and the PRED are predicted uh, profiles from sequence from the models. And you can see this is for four transcription factors, OC4, SOX2, NANOG, and KLF in mouse embryonic stem cells. Uh, the predictions of the models and the observed data are remarkably similar. In fact, when we, may, when we perform these kinds of evaluations genome-wide, uh, models are often as accurate as concordance between replicate experiments. So these models can really max out the prediction accuracy um, in terms of mapping sequence to these kinds of regulatory profiles. You'll see also instances where the models also enable extremely effective denoising. Here's an example of ChIP-seq data, which is very sparse. You can see there's a lot of missing information. In fact, these happen to be two different data sets targeting the same protein uh, with different antibodies. And the observed profiles can often look very different due to differences in data quality, batch effects, uh, sequencing depth. But when you use a model to make predictions from sequence, you can see the same region of the genome for the same readout are incredibly similar. So you also get the power of actually denoising and imputing missing information. But as I said, you know, uh, we are very excited that the models can make such accurate predictions. But I think um, what we're more excited about is the fact that these models can learn representations de novo from raw sequence. And so they must be able to learn some interesting biology. So um, unfortunately, neural networks typically have been considered black boxes. That is, you cannot really figure out what's going on, but I'll show you today that using the right tools, we can in fact use them as discovery engines. So the first question you might want to ask is, given a particular sequence in the genome, let's say you made, your model has made an accurate prediction for some kind of bi biomolecular event. How is the model making these predictions? Which nucleotides in the sequence are predictive of this output. And so my student Avanti, she actually developed a new method called DeepLift, which we published in 2017, which takes the model and reverse engineers the con con contributions of individual neurons in each of the layers of the network recursively all the way back to individual nucleotides. And so you get like a, a nice decomposition of the predictions of the output in terms of the contributions of individual nucleotides. And this approach is extremely useful to obtain high resolution annotations of uh, predictive nucleotides in any region in the genome in any context. And so here is an example of a distal enhancer that regulates the OCT4 gene in mouse embryonic stem cells. And we fitted BBNUT models to chip exo data for these four transcription factors, which all cooperatively bind that enhancer, as you can see right here. Beautiful footprints from the predicted data, which, very, which are very similar to the actual measured data. And so when we use deep lift and we try to interpret the contributions of individual nucleotides in the same sequence in terms of how it's contributing to binding of each of these four different factors, uh, we see that the model can really highlight um, very specific instances uh, of various kinds of motifs. 
And if we map these uh, nucleotides, these important nucleotides back to kind of known binding recognition codes, we can obtain uh, extremely high resolution annotations of these, uh, of these individual enhancers uh, in the context of how they are decoded by different kinds of regulatory proteins. So you can see some, uh, um, some motifs are very, some, some motifs are very specific to some proteins, whereas others are commonly used across the board. Now, this is quite useful if you want to interpret the models at individual loci, but maybe we also want to summarize uh, the global patterns learned by the model. So to do this, we've developed another tool called TF Modisco. And what this does is it takes um, a model, it uses deep lift to uh, infer the contributions of individual nucleotides for all the millions of sequences that let's say are bound by a protein of interest. Uh, deep lift highlights all of these interesting uh, high contribution score subsequences. So we can filter the remaining parts of the sequences out and just focus on the important nucleotide subsequences and then run a clustering algorithm. That's what TF Modisco does. It clusters these, um, these millions of patterns based on similarity and then collapses them into non-redundant motif-like representations. When we do that for proteins, uh, let's say just we want to understand what are, what's the model learning uh, in terms of predicting a binding for four transcription factors, log 4 soft and nanog and KLF, just for four transcription factors. Uh, the typical, uh, you know, the typical um, approach is that, or the hypothesis is that these proteins recognize maybe four to five to six motifs. However, in vivo, what we see is due to their uh, extreme cooperative binding interactions, uh, we need a much more complex repertoire of motifs to explain binding. Uh, in this case, we need about 50 distinct motifs to explain binding for just four transcription factors in one serotype. And each of these motifs, in fact, as I showed you before, um, have uh, combinatorial contributions uh, to binding of each of the four transcription factors. So you can see, for example, the OXOX heterodimer is, is important for binding for OX4, SOX2, and NANOC, whereas other motifs, such as these two right here, are very specific to NANOG. So this is one of the reasons why the recognition code in vivo in the genome is more complex than what we typically find in vitro is because these uh, factors often cooperate, giving rise to more complex uh, repertoires of recognition codes. And just to give you some examples, the neural networks can highlight very subtly different motifs. In this case, uh, we have three different motifs for NANOG. They have the same core TCA site, but different flanking regions. Uh, which have nice support from um, individual uh, experiments like MSI experiments, as well as crystal structure of nanog bound to DNA. So we have some nice validation that these uh, subtly different sort of species of motifs are in fact very likely biologically meaningful. What we also see is the model's ability to highlight very subtle low affinity patterns often flanking specific motifs. So here's an example of the nanog motif, the TCA motif I showed you before. And classical position frequency weight matrix representations of motifs uh, are unable to highlight anything going on in the flanking sequences around these motifs. But our neural network motifs actually highlight subtle plumes of TA80 rep repetitive sequences that, that rise up and fall. Um, and the periodicity of this sort of low affinity pattern in the, in the flanks of the nanog motif is exactly 10 and a half base pairs, which happens to be the helical turn of DNA. So uh, one interesting hypothesis here is that um, we assumed uh, or we made is that nanog potentially binds as homodimers um, to DNA such that the units of nanog uh, often are binding on the same side of the helix. And what's quite interesting is uh, homeobox proteins like nanog do have evidence of binding as homodimers even in vitro when measured in the context of nucleosomal DNA. So uh, we explicitly try to look for these kinds of patterns in the genome using the neural network identified motifs. And so if we look for specific spacing constraints between even the nano core sites, these TCA sites, uh, as shown right here on the x-axis is the pairwise motif distance between pairs of nano sites and the y-axis is, is, is just simply computing the, um, the frequency with which you see different distance constraints. You see this again, this beautiful helical periodicity pop up, which means that um, these, these enhancers have evolved to 
uh, essentially contain nanog motifs uh, with this sort of helical periodicity. And this is true for nanog with a whole bunch of other motifs as well. So this is quite interesting because we can start discovering syntax, but can we use the model in more interesting ways to actually perform uh, in silico experiments that can give us insight into how syntax drives cooperative mining? So I'll show you two examples of how we do this. Uh, one approach is of using the model as an oracle and using it to make predictions on synthetically designed sequences with very specific properties. So here, here we've designed a sequence in which we've embedded an analog motif at this position and an, another motif, uh, ox ox motif at this position. And we're gonna move um, this motif. We're gonna synthesize sequences where we, where we systematically move this motif towards this other motif. And we use the model to predict how binding of nanog changes and how binding of awk for changes simultaneously as we change the syntax, uh, the spacing syntax between these two motifs. And here we are graphing as a function of distance, the change in binding of the two TFs. So the, the, the golden curve represents the change in binding for nanog and the red curve represents the change of binding for awk for. You see something fascinating pop up, which is that as, the, as you reduce the distance between the two motifs, OCK4 really doesn't respond at all. So OCK4 essentially is acting like a classic pioneer factor, binds DNA, does its own thing. Nanog, on the other hand, has a massive cooperative uh, increase in its binding as the OXOX motif moves towards it. And you see this exponential rise in, in binding strength. And you also see this, again, this beautiful helical periodicity starting to kick in. So here what we're able to use is take the model and dissect a really interesting causal directional cooperative relationship between two transcription factors as a function of sequence syntax by using the model as a black box oracle, designing synthetic sequences with specific properties, and then querying the model and just getting graphing the answer, right? So it's a very powerful way to uh, decipher hypotheses. The other approach we can take is use the model again as an oracle to do in silico genome editing experiments. So instead of designing synthetic sequences, we can take a real enhancer sequences as shown right here. This is the same OCK4 enhancer I showed you before. We can use a model to derive inferences about the important uh, motifs in each of these sequences. As you can see here, the OXOX motif is driving NANOG and OCK4 binding, whereas the NANOG motif right here is only contributing to NANOG binding. We can do systematic deletion experiments where we delete the OXOX motif, and now we use a model to predict what would happen to binding of the two factors. And as you can see, the model predicts a destruction of binding of OCK4 and of NANOG. And we can do the inverse experiment where we delete NANOG motif and look at the effect again. And you can see it has no effect on OCK4 and has only a minor effect on NANOG. And if we summarize this now across the whole genome, across all the enhancers that are bound by OCK4 and NANOG, we see this kind of, again, this beautiful asymmetric uh, cooperative effect as a function of syntax uh, with sort of a helical periodicity kicking in. So we are able to replicate the synthetic experiment through in silico genome editing experiment. We can then use these predictions to design real experiments to validate these discoveries. So in this case, uh, Julia, uh, who is my collaborator on this, on this work, uh, her lab designed CRISPR experiments that uh, specifically took enhancers in the genome that are bound by SOX2 and NANOG. And uh, the model predicts that mutating these two bases inside this motif would have a strong impact. These are the predictions of the model. The blue uh, curve is the um, uh, predictions of the model for SOX2 binding with the uh, original motif in the genome. And then if we make the mutation using CRISPR, we mutate the TT to an AG. The model predicts this red curve, which is showing an attenuation of binding right at the motif, as well as a proximal attenuation at a nearby footprint right here. Uh, the, the, if you perform the actual experiment, you see remarkable concordance between the predictions of the model and the actual experiment. And this is also true if we look at the, the predictions of the model on binding of NANOG after we make a disruption to the SOX2 motif. <clears throat> so this is just an example of how we can use a model to test millions of hypotheses in silico and then identify interesting designs which we can validate in the lab using uh, for example, real genome editing experiments. And lastly, in my last minute, I just want to show you how we can also use the models to prioritize functional genetic variation. So one of the things we have done here is we've trained BPNet models on, on binding data for the SPI1 transcription factor. We've trained BPNet models on DNA-seq data. 
and on H3K27 oscillation chip seek data. And then we can use those three models to simultaneously uh, predict the effects of an allelic change at one of these nucleotides, uh, which is, happens to be a variant that is a validated binding QTL for this pi one protein. Uh, what the model predicts is when you switch the C allele to a G allele, you see this massive amplification of, of binding of the transcription factor, the same enhancer season amplification as predicted by the model for DNA seq, chromatin accessibility, and a corresponding amplification for histone modification, H3K27 acetylation. And then using the interpretation tools we have, we can further dissect uh, what parts of the sequence are really driving this allelic effect. And as you can see here, uh, the G allele induces a powerful, uh, a very powerful SPI1 motif that really enhances the signal at each of these different layers of regulatory activity. Last but not least, we can also use this to interpret causal variants in disease loci. And this is an example of um, uh, a GWAS locus in Alzheimer's disease. Um, this is next to the PICAM gene. And um, if you actually look at all the SNPs in that locus, uh, that are in strong LD with the tag SNP. There are about 165 candidates. The causal variant is not very well known in this locus. Uh, we use models trained on single cell ataxic data uh, from uh, post-mortem human brains. And using this data, we can dissect uh, individual cell types and cell populations. We can train BPNet models on uh, the pseudo bulk ataxic data in each of these cell populations. And as I showed you in the previous slide, we can use the models to predict the effects of each of these 165 variants um, in each of the cell types and tissues. And what we identify is the model really homes in on one variant in this locus, um, which happens to exactly overlap an enhancer, putative enhancer that is very specifically active in oligodendrocytes. And that enhancer uh, appears to be looping uh, to regulate the PICAM gene promoter. And when we take our interpretation tools to in interpret what the allele is actually doing, the G allele versus the A allele of that predicted uh, causal variant, you can see that the G allele in fact induces uh, uh, a motif of the FOSS transcription factor. So we can get very specific hypotheses about potential function of these variants um, as shown right here in the context of any disease uh, with well-matched um, um, uh, regulatory profiling experiments in interesting disease relevant cell types and tissues. Uh, so just to summarize, um, hopefully I was able to show you today that when we take black box predictor models and you couple them with powerful interpretation frameworks, uh, we don't have to have the trade-off between prediction accuracy and interpretation. We can in fact have extremely predictive models that we can also use for biological discovery of causal phenomena and hypothesis generation, uh, as well as optimized experimental design. One thing we have to be really careful about going forward is models are going to be a very important commodity and going to be as important as data sets we generate, but it will be equally important to be transparent about the limits, blind spots, biases, and pitfalls of each of our models. And just to give an outlook of what we need going forward, uh, I believe we need large scale harmonized machine learning ready observational and perturbation data sets. We need decentralized, scalable, affordable compute resources enabled in, uh, to enable training of large scale models across these data sets. We need unified ecosystems where the compute, the data, the models, and the literature really sit right next to each other and interact with each other. And most importantly, we really need new kinds of user interfaces to models to enable interactive discovery, search, and design. And lastly, um, as a community, we really need to incentivize collaborative efforts and diverse contributions. And with that, I'll just uh, stop there and thank uh, uh, the members of my lab who have been instrumental in performing uh, all of this fantastic research and work. Um, we, again, I want to highlight the fact that none of this is actually possible without extensive collaborations with people with uh, fantastic scientists with different skill sets, and of course, um, the funding agencies that support this work. Thank you. So thank you for a fascinating talk. We have a, a number of questions that have come through in the Q&A and, and let me just start by posing one of those to you, which is, um, do you need to train a separate model for each assay in BPNet 
And also related to that, can you say a bit more about how the BP net takes into account the cellular context, right? So how would it make predictions across different cell types for it? Yeah, that's a, that's a great question. Hope you can hear me. Um, so yeah, we, we train BPNet models on, uh, think of, think of uh, BPNet model as a computational representation of an experiment, right? So every time you perform an experiment, you fit a model and then you use the model to gain insights into that experiment. So the current model I presented today is a is an assay specific, context specific model. It, it, it doesn't have much use outside the context of the assay. Well, it has use outside the context of the assay because uh, many of the features that the models learn generalize to other assays too. For example, in the paper, we've shown how a BBNet model trained on binding data can actually predict effects of uh, trans effects of depletion of, of transcription factors on chromatin accessibility and on reporter experiments. So the representations learned by the model can definitely generalize, but uh, very much in the context that you train the model in. So there's, there's a specific model for every transcription factor in every cell type. Uh, and so uh, the model generalizes to predictions within that context, but not necessarily outside the current model. There are certainly ways to generalize or train models that will actually be able to make predictions outside the context they're trained in, but that's not what I currently showed in this talk. There's some questions about deep lift and the scope of deep lift. Can you use it on other models, other convolutional neural networks? And maybe you could explain. Um, yes, um, so deep lift is a very general approach for, um, it, it's, a, it, it's part of a family of approaches which are referred to as uh, feature attribution approaches. And there, are, there is a large family of these uh, methods. Uh, Sue and Lee, who's a speaker, I think in the next session, uh, she has actually built, um, uh, uh, she and one of her students uh, has had built um, a unifying um, principle of how you uh, take all of these different attribution methods and put them in the context of, of a very well-defined uh, sort of theoretical framework. And so um, deep lift, deep sharp, all of these methods can be used largely with any kind of neural network um, in working on any kind of data. So it's, it's not specific to, uh, to genomic data. I will say that the effectiveness of these methods is very domain specific. Uh, for example, people have used these kinds of methods on imaging data as well and so forth. And uh, the kinds of attributions you get there often tend to be much noisier, much more unreliable. Uh, we are lucky that DNA sequences are discrete. They have four nucleotides. And so there's a lot more um, stability. There's a lot more interpretability that pops out of, of using these approaches. And I just want to highlight based on that statement that um, we have to be careful how we uh, take methods developed for one domain and apply them in another. Because uh, in genomics, we have inherited a lot of machine learning tools applied in other domains. And uh, one of our instincts typically is to take the models or, or the approaches and apply them directly as is. But we always have to be quite careful and do the necessary checks to make sure that the methods work uh, better or worse in the domains we actually apply them to. There's also a question about the sensitivity of the model to the window size that's being used. Yeah, it's a very good question. So um, if you notice in my second, you may not notice, but in my second last slide where I showed the effect of a variant on multiple regulatory phenotypes, so there was binding accessibility and histone marks, my windows were different sizes. So I had like a one KB window for binding, about a two KB for accessibility and six KB for, mm -hmm. uh, for histones. And that's because um, the, these marks obviously, I mean, or different readouts have different landscape sizes, right? And they spread or not. Some are very punctate, others are much broader. And you also, some of them are affected much more by long range distal effects. Uh, some were, you know, Christina showed a really nice talk yesterday on how extremely distal, you know, uh, enhancers can have very strong effects on expression. Um, so you do, do have to be careful about how you design the um, receptive field of the model, that is how much of the sequence it actually sees. And for the binding and accessibility experiments, and we and others have shown that you don't get much gain beyond the, you know, beyond like a 2KB window. You can predict most of what's happening uh, using 2KB, but as soon as you go to histone modifications, gene expression, you often need megabases of, of sequence space to look at 
to really get accurate models. Can I ask one quick question? In your interpretation of variance at the end in the Alzheimer's example, so you had, did you have um, single cell data in a normal brain or disease? And were you using um, training BPNET uh, separately on pseudobulk for different clusters with just the reference genome or so, so just the specifics of that example? Yes, uh, this was a healthy human brain uh, postmortem uh, sample. Uh, clearly, that would miss disease, uh, like very important cell states that are disease specific, you know, inflammatory states and so forth. And that's one of the reasons why we cannot, we don't get, we're not able to map every GWAS locus. We are able to map quite a few, but not all. Um, we do train BVNN models on pseudobulk ataxy from each of those cell states. And um, sorry, what was the last? Last part of the question. Reference genome. Just yes, we, we currently do use a reference genome. Uh, um, it's uh, the results certainly uh, get better if you actually include allelic effects. We currently use allelic effects as validation because we didn't have separate validation experiments, but we're now doing CRISPR and NPRA experiments as independent validation, and so now we can incorporate the allelic information in the sequence itself uh, as before before training the models. Thanks so much. I, I think we have to move on. And thanks so much for a great talk. Um, our uh, last speaker for this session is Gregory Cooper, who is a professor of biomedical informatics at the University of Pittsburgh. Hello, uh, I'm Greg Cooper from the University of Pittsburgh. Uh, I'll be presenting a talk on personalized causal machine learning using genomic data. And this is a, a joint work with my colleague, Dr. Shimwa Lu and others whom I'll mention a bit later. I'll first briefly discuss causal machine learning and then introduce a particular version of it that learns personalized models. Much of the talk will be devoted to a synthetic example and two real examples. Finally, I'll finish by mentioning some extensions, a few comments about the ideal data to use for personalized causal machine learning, and, and finally, some conclusions. As we no, science is centrally concerned with the discovery of causal relationships, including, of course, genomic science. We uh, want to understand mechanisms of action, such as the molecular details of transcription regulation. We also would like to predict the results of interventions, such as the cellular effects of a gene modification. Importantly, causal knowledge also provides insight about how to control events such as how to reduce the overexpression of a genomic driver of cancer. Traditional machine learning algorithms learn the causal relationships that exist in an entire population, such as a population of patients with a particular disease. Doing so, however, may result in learning a mixture of the causal relationships that are operating within subgroups in the population. It may sometimes also be the case that only the strongest shared relationships are learned. In contrast, learning causal relationships specific to a given instance, such as a patient, uh, allows us to understand more precisely the causal mechanisms acting in the patient, which can help guide the maintenance of health and curing of disease for that patient. As an example uh, of instance-specific causal machine learning, uh, we can uh, look at identifying the somatic genomic alterations, uh, such as gene mutations of an individual tumor. Typically, there can be hundreds of such SGAs, only a relatively few of which are actually driving the cancerous behavior of the tumor. Moreover, moreover our knowledge of all the drivers of cancer um, is incomplete. As an example of instance-specific causal modeling, I'll present the TCI algorithm, which stands for Tumor-Specific Causal Inference, which takes as input a large data set of omic data, such as the Cancer Genome Atlas data, also called TCGA, and omic data about an individual patient, such as SGAs and differentially expressed genes, or, or DEGs, and then outputs a bipartite network of causal relationships between the SGAs and the DEGs that are supported um, both by TCGA and the patient's data. We used DNA data and expression data in this application, 
Uh, in particular, we define an SGA as being one if the gene uh, contains any non-synonymous somatic mutation or has an abnormal degree of copy number variation. Otherwise, it is uh, zero. We define a DEG as being one if the gene was significantly differentially expressed relative to a baseline. This slide shows that in general, TCI can learn the relationships between SGAs uh, and various types of phenotypes or endophenotypes where we use DEGs in the current example. We posited SGAs that are estimated to cause abnormal gene expression in a given tumor are good candidates for drivers of cancer in that tumor. TCI uses a bipartite, bipartite graph representation. It searches the graph for relationships between SGAs and the DEGs. In doing so, it applies a Bayesian evaluation measure using TCGA data and patient-specific tumor data in order to score each graph in a tumor-specific manner. Although time doesn't permit explaining the score, the scoring measure, um, it's described in the paper shown in, in the bottom here of the slide. I'll now sequence through a simplified version of a TCI search to uh, give a, a sense of the search process, which is pretty straightforward. The nodes here denote variables and the red nodes denote variables with abnormal values, namely the SGAs and the DEGs. TCI only retains the SGAs and the DEGs among the variables. It assumes that the DEGs are being caused by the SGAs. Uh, this in and of itself renders TCI instance specific because the effects of interest and their potential causes are both tumor specific. The SGAs are modeled as variables instantiated to the values in the current tumor being modeled. The DEGs are modeled as uninstantiated variables. For each DEG, the algorithm searches for the SGA that's most likely its cause. It scores each SGA in turn as a potential cause of a DEG. Here we're focused on DEG E1. It looks at each possible SGA as a cause. <clears throat> then it assigns as the cause the most probable SGA uh, of the DEG according to the Bayesian scoring measure. It performs a similar search for the uh, other DEGs here looking for the cause of DEG E3. And it then finds in this case A1 is the most probable cause. And finally for DEG E4 it searches and finally it arrives at the most probable network which it outputs along with the posterior probability of each arc. TCI makes the assumption that in a given tumor, each DEG has only one driver. This assumption is based on the observation that SGAs perturbing members of a common pathway rarely co-occur in an individual tumor, which is a phenomenon uh, referred to in the literature as mutual exclusivity. This assumption can be relaxed, but we've not found a compelling need to do so up, up to this point in TCI. As an example involving real data, consider the PI3K pathway that controls the gene uh, MPL, for which there's evidence that upregulation promotes leukemia, develop, leukemia development. GWAS uh, EQTL analysis finds the PIK3CA as a strong driver of MPL, and overall PIK3CA is the dominant driver. However, the EQTL analysis does not find P10, PIK3R1, or AKT1 as strong drivers of MPL, because they are overshadowed by PIK3CA in a population-wide analysis. The diagram on the right shows information for a single tumor. Uh, the green squares denote SGAs, one of which is PIK3CA. Of the approximately 300 SGAs in this particular tumor, PIK3CA was analyzed by TCI as the driver of MPL with probability greater than 99%. In general, when PIK3CA is, is an SGA and MPL is a DEG, TCA assigns PIK3CA as a driver similar to the EQTL analysis. However, uh, consider the tumor data on the right here uh, where PIK3CA is not somatically altered, but PIK3R1 is. 
Here TCI assigns PIC3 R1 as the most probable driver of MPL and with high probability, which is, a re is reasonable in light of the pathway shown to the left. As, as mentioned, an EQTL analysis does not do so. Similarly, here P10 is given a high probability <clears throat> of being the driver of MPL. And here AKT1 is assigned as a driver with probability about 90%. So in summary, in a given tumor, TCI analyzes driver gene possibilities in light of the genes that are somatically altered in that tumor. Of those possibilities, it finds the one that is the most likely driver based on a Bayesian scoring measure. More broadly, we applied um, TCI to over 5,000 tumors in TCGAA. Uh, the x-axis uh, here shows those genes that TCI called drivers with high probability when they were somatically altered. The uh, y-axis shows those genes that were frequently called drivers according to their absolute count in tumors in TCGA. The genes with names in blue um, are known cancer drivers. Uh, in the top right in blue is TP53, which is not surprising that, that it would be at the top right. Uh, the genes with names in red were not on the consensus list um, as known drivers when we performed uh, this study several years ago. CSMD3 uh, uh, was ranked uh, highly by TCI as a driver and it, it is somatically altered often in tumors uh, in TCGA. However, it's uh, not a known uh, cancer driver uh, at the time of this analysis. Therefore, we uh, selected it to perform a cancer cell line study. In particular, we found a cancer cell line in which CSMD3 was being highly expressed. We then knocked it down using two different siRNAs <clears throat> and observed the resulting behavior of those cell lines compared to controls. The results of, uh, for the cells that were knocked down are uh, shown here with stripes and dots and the cells not knocked down are shown in white. The knocked down cells showed uh, significantly, significantly less cell proliferation uh, than the cells that were not, particularly um, at six days. Similarly, the cells that had uh, CSMD3 knocked down showed significantly less cell migration. Uh, these results are supportive of S uh, CSMD3 being a cancer driver gene in some situations although additional investigation um, is needed. The uh, Cosmic Cancer Database now classifies CSMD3 as a tier two cancer gene, meaning that there is strong emerging evidence that it has a role in cancer. Uh, this provides additional support uh, for the gene being a cancer driver. Representative uh, related work is shown here. Uh, there's been prior work on modeling and learning context specific independence, such as that used in T by TCI. Other work has investigated learning instance specific models, some of which are non causal and others causal. To our knowledge, however, there has not been prior work on Bayesian methods for learning instance specific causal Bayesian networks, um, as in TCI. We are extending uh, TCI to use sets of variables that yield a lower dimensional embedding uh, that can serve to provide confounder control. We're also further developing and applying methods uh, such as one we call IGFCI, which can learn instance specific causal pathways between the genomic drivers and the resulting phenotypes found by TCI. IGFCI models for the possibility of uh, latent confounder variables also. We've recently applied IGFCI to single cell data to explore possible molecular pathways that are involved in immune regulation uh, and that work is under review. The ideal situations in which to apply instant specific causal machine learning methods such as TCI and IGFCI include those with high quality measurements that are tissue specific include data about the cells in the microenvironment of the disease uh, under study, and include multiple types of measurements within single cells. Nevertheless, the TCI and IGFCI methods do not require such data for us to apply them currently. <clears throat> 
briefly, in conclusion, we believe that instance-specific causal machine learning is a promising approach for analyzing genomic data in many diseases, not just in cancer. Additional development evaluation are needed and are ongoing in our lab and in others. These are two main references for the material I presented, which provide much more technical details and uh, results than we had time to get into today. I'd like to uh, sincerely thank Drs. Fatima Jabari and Chun Wei Kai for slides and figures that they contributed to this talk. Also, thanks to Dr. Sham Deshwesh Warren, Dr. Kai, and Dr. Jabari for their <coughs> contributions to this research. And finally, I'd like to acknowledge NIH and NSF for their funding support. Thank you very much for your attention. Uh, I look forward to your comments and questions during the discussion period. Also, regarding follow up, uh, please feel free to contact Dr. Liu and me at the email addresses shown here. Thank you. Thank you so much for the talk. Uh, we have time for questions and we're also uh, uh, inviting uh, Dr. Xinghua Lu, uh, uh, Dr. Cooper's collaborator to, to help answer the questions. So I, I think there are um, a bunch of questions about, uh, about the cause, causality in the model and um, also some, some specifics on, on how uh, you're encoding differentially expressed genes. So uh, one question is, um, uh, can you extend the TCI model to include the direction of differential expression uh, that right now you're coding as one or zero, for, you know, uh, up or down? Um, can you encode expression level instead of discretizing? Um, can you model co-occurring uh, somatic drivers? So I, I, I see um, uh, Xinhua's answering in the Q&A, but you can answer verbally for everybody. Oh, okay, so maybe then I'll answer instead of, uh, regarding the discretization of the DEGs, what are we really interested in is to see, um, you know, if there's one signal that turns on, one gene is downward regulated, another gene is up regulated, it doesn't, doesn't discredit them on, for our model, it doesn't matter. It only indicates these two genes are co-regulated by one potential signal. So in that case, so we found out it's not necessarily differentiated whether down-regulated. Of course, when we process data, we always keep track. We want to detect the signal as a consistent in one direction. So that's a that's sort of premise. But I think you know, uh, just to build on that, uh, it, it, we can it can be done, um, and we have done it. Uh, before, both in terms of uh, coding up and down, and encoding um, the level, the you know the the uh, precise level of DNA uh, of gene expression. So, uh, in terms of um, uh, coding uh, different uh, combinations of SGAs, I don't think we've done that, um, and that's something that could be done. Okay, and another kind of related question: um, the analysis if since the analysis is always conditional on SGA equals one, right? Like on, on the somatic driver being there, how do you, uh, could you elaborate on how you identify causal pairs without variability of SGA? Maybe, maybe more broadly, can you, can you explain in, in a bit of detail um, what makes the mod model qualify as a causal model? Yeah, so, you know, I, I think um, I, I, got, I probably could have made that a little bit more explicit. I'm glad we have that question, which is basically because this is um, you know, uh, cancer data, we're making the assumption that um, we don't have any uh, hidden confounding between the SPAs and the DEGs. Um, the IGFCI algorithm that I mentioned can model for that, but the TCI assumes that we don't have any hidden confounding um, and therefore it's not there from the beginning or we control for it. Um, in cancer, we think that's a reasonable assumption, but in some other um, diseases, it, it would not be that we're venturing into now. Um, so um, being able to do um, you know, lower dimensional representations 
of the entire genome and use that as for confounder control is probably going to be pretty important. Um, and in terms of the former question having to do with um, a fixed value for the SGA, roughly what's going on is um, it's looking for um, an SGA from your training data, which uh, leads to a distribution of your DEG, which is skewed towards zero or one. In other words, it, it has more information about what the DEG is. So it's looking through all the SGAs, looking at the training data and finding an SGA that leads to a very skewed distribution of your DEG, which means it's giving you more information about the DEG. Can you re elaborate on why you think that for this particular case of cancer, it's a reasonable assumption that there are hidden confounders, but you're, you're cautious about carrying that assumption over to other contexts? Um, well, I, I think that we're, we're making the assumption, I know it's a, it's a rough assumption, it's a first order approximation that the um, um, interventions, if you will, the, um, the, the changes that are happening uh, in the uh, DNA are you know, random, that they aren't being, something's not causing those changes and also causing the DEGs to change, that there's not some sort of hidden confounder of both those events. I'm sure that there probably are uh, in, you know, in, in if, if you look hard enough, but as a first order approximation, uh, we're making uh, that assumption about the semi-randomness, if you will, of the um, somatic genomic alterations. Um, Shamwa, did you want to add, add, yeah. add to that? Yeah, because uh, the, in the cancer, these mutation events are somatic events. So, so it's on, you know, if it has a population structure, GWAS, uh, the GWAS study, a SNP can have the covariance with the gene expression because of the genetic structures, uh, population structure. But at cancer, is relatively, this is minimized, is minimized because of the event, mutation event is random relative to this particular case. It's so you do not really see population-wise the confounded. The likelihood of the expression of the gene and the mutation event is confounded by something is less likely happen. And then when you go to the GWAS and population-wise. Okay, hey, thanks so much for the talk. I think that we should um, bring all the speakers in and have our 30 minute uh, wrap up discussion. And uh, uh, we are, you know, happy to take questions for all the speakers in the Q and A. Maybe we should start with one question um, as we wait uh, for Q and A questions. Um, you know, the, the session is about uh, resource needs for machine learning. And um, Alexis commented on, on how some of the large consortium efforts led to a lot of creative work. Um, what, are, what, are, what are we missing? Like what, what, are, what are the data sets that we need and don't have if, if you were advising NHGRI? Anyone wanna take that? I'm happy to start. Um, you know, I think some of these questions came up during the Q&A after my talk, but I'm obviously very invested in the idea of context specificity. And I think that we do need functional data and that would include epigenetic data and expression data in, you know, many more cell types and contexts than we currently have at a large scale across multiple individuals. Um, and we need that to be again, readily accessible to the research community, not, not only available to the 10 PIs who are part of a consortium, but really readily available. Um, so how do we do that? You know, how do we access multiple conditions and multiple cell types? I have some particular experimental ideas in mind, but I'm really interested to hear what other people think too. Um. Yeah, I, I can also add to that. I agree completely with Alexis. Um, I think one one inter interesting and important aspect is um, 
re releasing data to uh, to expedite you know machine learning uh, development right and and the current strategies of releasing data that we have even from large consortia which i've been part of um, have been releasing data in formats that are designed for consumption uh, for example through genome browsers and you know um, uh, relatively low throughput consumption right whereas uh, just to give an example um, when i was working on the roadmap epigenomics project um, i released uh, some of the uniformly processed data which you know which was a lot of effort like making sure you try to remove confounders and um, trying to normalize the data sets and so forth almost two years before we published the paper. So data was already released, but the process data was also two years. And then Olga Travenskaya's group actually took that data and created this deep sea data set, which is a processed version of that. And that processed version of the data has served as a benchmark data set for many other methods that are built on top of it, right? If every machine learning, every person who does machine learning for genomics had to go back to the raw roadmap data or, or even the process roadmap data and figure out how to create that matrix and keep doing that again and again. Um, it's, it's a tremendous in time investment, right? And, and some people can do this and we need better ways of sharing those process data sets. They should not be sitting in supplementary websites or papers. They should be in major portals where people can plug into them rapidly, you know, prototype models, do comparisons and so forth. So I think there is also a difference between uh, releasing high quality process data, but uh, making sure that we realize uh, for different use cases, we might require different uh, formats, different uh, mechanisms for importing and so forth. I completely agree with that, Anshul. I think that there's sort of two issues. One of them is uh, making data available early. You know, so, you know, GTEx came under some criticism for um, holding back data until, you know, a publication time and things like that. And, and we could make data available earlier. And I think that we should do that. But the other thing is making process data available. So a lab, your lab, my lab may process the data in a new way. We should be able to make that available publicly, you know, immediately in some format. And I think things like Anvil and others can enable this technically, but we need to enable it sort of like procedurally as well. Maybe you want to explain for the audience what Anvil is. <laughs> um, I'm not sure that I even can do it justice, but you know, uh, I think that the community has been looking for a way to do cloud computing um, and to access multiple different data sets such as GTEx and others, um, you know, easily and accessibly and reproducibly. And Anvil is an NIH supported framework that is, you know, Johns Hopkins and, and my colleague Mike Schatz is, is leading part of this is one of the ways that we're trying to do this. Um, but I think, you know, procedurally, when we do a new study, we still need to make that available as soon as possible. But I would definitely encourage everyone to look into um, using Anvil for data sets that do exist already. So, yeah, I also wanted to highlight another instance like uh, Alexis had in her, in her slide the recount. Uh, database, which is, I think, a phenomenal effort of taking RNA-seq from the planet, basically, and uniformly putting it into a format and, and processing and making sure it all works out. And, you know, what people can do with those kinds of data sets is, is, is it really targets the machine learning community and the computational biology community who, who want to work off that. They don't want to spend like three years reprocessing everything and figuring out how to normalize it. Like they could build very quickly on top of that. But, but that has to be done very carefully. Otherwise, batch exactly. effects and other confounders just propagate exactly. to all that community, right? Exactly. Right, but we're, you know, but if one, you know, if one or a few labs do work on that, then we can share those results with people, which I think is a, a really effective way to, to help address this problem. So following up on this, this theme of making data kind of available and accessible for machine learning, I'm interested in hearing your comments about metadata and from past projects like GTEx or the roadmap epigenome, to what extent metadata has been, has, it, has enabled machine learning versus uh, to what extent has there not been the, the metadata that's really needed to, to facilitate it? My experience has been that um, 
this is critical that um, confounding technical artifacts are pervasive in large scale genomics, even in the best designed experiments. You know, so of course we should do good experimental design where we randomize batches with respect to whatever feature we're trying to look at. Of course we should do that. But even in population scale data, you know, the reality is that technical artifacts actually dominate um, biological effects in, in many of these data, including GTEx. Um, and being able to demonstrate that we can identify those is, is really important and metadata supports that. Um, so I really, really encourage, you know, all of us to, to track that. And I think that there's a tendency among some of our collaborators on the experimental side to think like, well, my data is good, right? And so like, what is good? Like it's, it's good, but that doesn't mean that it's completely free of any sort of technical variation, right? So we need to track these things still, and we need to be able to identify when, you know, in single cell sequencing, it's actually even more important than what we've looked at in bulk, but we need to be able to track when some of the variation that we're observing might be due to some of the de technical variation and having metadata enables us to show that. And I think that's just, it's just incredibly important. And Anshul, I don't know what your experience has been with, you know, you know, obviously I'm usually working out on like cross individual population scale data. I don't know what you think about that with respect to more like cell type variation and encode. So maybe you can comment on that. Yeah, uh, you know, I, I want to give Greg a chance in case he wants to, um, uh, to add something here. I, I'm happy to, uh, I'm, I definitely have lots of thoughts on this. I'll, I'll, I'll follow up. Uh, well, I mean, I, I, I agree with what's been said. I, I, I think metadata for the reasons is, is, is really quite critical. And I just wanted to briefly uh, also answer Christina's earlier question about the types of data. Um, and uh, I don't, this may have been said, I don't think so, but I think having tissue specific uh, disease data, genomic tissue specific data is quite important. Um, and I think it's very, as far as I know, fa fairly uh, r relatively rare. Uh, but as we get into trying to understand different diseases in detail, having single cell disease specific data in the tissues that are experiencing the disease and knowing what the microenvironment looks like in that disease tissue, for example, the heart, um, is quite important. And uh, I realize the challenges, but I think it's uh, quite quite important to seek that goal. Yeah, so if I can just add on the um, metadata aspect. Um, yeah, I think ENCODE is a great uh, case study for this because honestly, um, you know, I think it is one of the most uh, heterogeneous consortia in terms of data types. And we have to give real kudos to the ENCODE DCC, which has really spent in incredible amounts of effort uh, on metadata. And um, I think there are two reasons why, two types of metadata that are extremely important. Alexis, I think, uh, also raised this. Is One is just description of the samples in a standardized format, uh, which includes all kinds of information about you know, technical stuff and dates and who did it and when and what exactly the sample is, linking it to ontologies and so forth. The other aspect is the QC. And this is a very important piece of metadata that we often do not call metadata. So. Uh, one of the biggest problems of working with data, or for example, in larger public repositories like Geo, they have incredible data sets. You just cannot, like, it would take years to align these data, figure out like exactly what they are, because there is no standardized metadata. And more importantly, there are no QC metrics associated with it. So are we going to download like all of Geo, reprocess it, and start ranking things manually by, because you cannot automate QC either that easily, right? I mean, so that is what we do, and it's really hard. Right. Exactly, <laughs> it, is, it is extremely hard. And, you know, maybe a few of us uh, with, with sufficient resources and, and experience potentially can do that, but it is a real bottleneck for people who have the skill sets to analyze the data, but then are focusing on, unfortunately, on, you know, um, mislabeled antibodies, batch effects, you know, all, all those issues, right? Is one of the reasons I think consortium data sets are so popular is because they have this uniformity, they have all this data. And if you can somehow use the consortia experience as a, you know, as, as a launch point to do this globally, 
for all data, that would just be revolutionary. I think that would have the highest impact ever compared to anything else we would ever do. So that's that's my view on, on this. I agree. And, and maybe like a small plug, you know, I've obviously been involved in consortia for, you know, basically my entire career and it's come under criticism. You know, many of you may feel like, you know, why are we spending so much money on, you know, GTEx or, you know, some of these consortia efforts. And I understand that, um, you know, and I'm not, I'm not, I'm not on one side or the other of this argument. I do think that these large data sets enable, especially machine learning and computational methods that are not possible if we don't have these large data sets. I do think that we should also reconsider like how exactly are they run? And this is something that I think is very relevant for NIH to consider, you know, when does the data get released? When, do, when does the larger community have access to it? Do we have embargoes? Um, I think these are really important questions. And I think that giving people access to data earlier and, and more broadly would be really beneficial for the community. But I think that, that we're not gonna do some of the science that we do without these large data sets and they cannot be collected in a single lab. They just can't. So, so how do we manage that? I think is a really important question to consider. Okay, uh, there are questions in the um, Q and A, but I think they're they're sort of related to this general discussion. You know, guidelines for what kind of um, metadata should be supported in in geo. But but uh, you know, I I think this is all really important. But maybe we should also um, address some other questions. So uh, you know, what struck me watching the talks, um, you know. Uh, Alexis's talk is a uh, population scale looking at uh, um, uh, effects across population, right? But, uh, and, and that's sort of one axis. And Anshul's talk is a different axis of looking at the details of transcription factor, regulatory logic, and in specific cell types. Uh, and, and Greg, you know, also, you know, can cancer uh, 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 level, but how do we, you know, how do we move, uh, combine the axes, right? So um, there, there's a little, there's a little bit of work now and a lot, a lot of interest um, in moving these kind of deep learning models into population genetics. What are the barriers and what, and, and what, what do you think has been accomplished and what needs to be done for, for, for anyone in the panel? Um, I'm gonna let Anshul answer most of this, but I will say that one of the big barriers is that in you know, natural variation, the effect sizes are just very small. Yes. And you know, we have shown over and over and over again, you know, not my lab, but many others have shown over and over and again that like additive models are pretty good. <laughs> Um, you know, and the effects of it are so small that it's, it's quite hard to apply more complex models to these, but yeah, Anshul and Greg, please chime in. Yeah, I mean, and I think um, <clears throat> there are, in, in my view, there are two, two fundamental, or uh, maybe three fundamental uh, <clears throat> issues here which could, could lead to improvements. Uh, I think the first is exactly what uh, Alexis said, is the, the machine, like let's call them machine learning models, but they, these are all machine learning models, but uh, let's just take the examples of the deep learning models that are trained across the genome, right? The variation they are focusing on is large scale variation of like when you go from one bin of the genome to the other, you see dramatic changes in the sequence and you see corresponding dramatic changes in the effect sizes of that sequence. And so the models are fitting to very large variants in the data. So they're very good at predicting effects of deleting motifs, uh, you know, changing syntax. They have literally never been trained. I mean, they've never seen in, the, in this training regime, the effect of what happens when you change a single base, right? And so it's literally kind of like an out of distribution prediction for, for a deep learning model. The fact that the even kind of work is fascinating. Right. I mean, the fact that they kind of even work the way because they, they really should not be. Right. So because I, we take these models that are trained across the genome and we do apply them to yes. individual variation. And we show that, you know, you've shown that there is some predictive accuracy, exactly. but that's not what they're trained to do. Right. Exactly. So I think one way forward is to um, is to, of course, I mean, you can absolutely, first of all, encode alleles into the inputs 
But more importantly, you can train them directly on effect sizes that matter to you, which is effect size of variance. Right now, I don't think there are any models in the in the literature that directly fine tune these models on allelic effects, which you can get for free from the data that you actually measure, because you can you can infer the alleles, you can infer the allelic effects. And can uh, we do all of that, or are better methods needed to deal with um, genotype data and better implication and better allele specific analysis? You know, is that a barrier? Um, I don't think it's actually a barrier. I just think the the people working in this space are coming from different. Also, that's a, that's the second problem I was partially mentioning is that um, uh, you know people coming from the deep learning space have a specific view of how to uh, model these data. They have their interests are often regulation versus variant effects, and the the statistical genetic folks really understand variation, but often. Um, you know, uh, don't use the regulatory data at, at the fine scale that you potentially can using these neural networks, right? So one interesting approach, and Alexis and I actually have uh, written recently grants together with the hope that we can actually work together in this space, is using the predictions of the, of the deep learning models as priors within statistical genetics models, right? So there's lots of powerful information that the deep learning models can give you, but you need the statistical models that directly focus on variation information uh, to really sort of fine tune that information out and get to. So I think there's really, you know, there's going to be a very interesting work, I think, in the next few years, coupling these two. David Kelly already has interesting work in this space and so forth. Yeah. I mean, one thing I want to point out, you know, is that all of these models require data. And if you look at, at GWAS, where we've actually been able to show, you know, extreme polygenicity and effect sizes of, you know, many, many variants on many of these complex traits that we're talking about data sets of, you know, hundreds of thousands of individuals, sometimes up to millions of individuals. Our largest EQTL data sets are usually thousands, right? So, you know, we aren't able to model those corresponding effect sizes as accurately from EQTL data as we are for GWAS. And, and we do need more data to do that. Yeah, maybe I'll have some comments too. So in addition to we need more data, it's just how you splice the data. For example, I think I'm just really excited by the Alexis and the talk is concentrated on the individual rare ones. And, and like yesterday, Dr. Tovo also mentioned there's a, you know, um, digital twins, not concepts, it's basically say you find a subset of the patients, a subset of populations within this and zoom in within that particular subset of population, you potentially may find something you wouldn't you would be ignored, which would be ignored by the whole population wise because the population structure, all those things may contribute into that. I think what Greg already showed one slide, so just like the, the using the, using the, um, the PI3K pathway, right? But if you're ranking at the population level, the PI3, pic 3 r one is, is ranked relatively low, but once you zoom in into the subpopulation, of the tumors only have the PI3, pic 3 r one mutations. And then looking into the impact of this particular event, you may find about much a stronger signal. So that's what is motivated, I think is a, um, um, in addition to um, increase the population and the dissected the population in a certain way to strengthen the signal, signal potentialization. So we recently also tried to using the TCI method to migrate to the GWAS study. And we do find out in our, when you dissect the population and zoom in certain subpopulation, you can significantly increase the capability of detecting a rare events with impact. So that's a potential another direction, say not only increase the size, but it's how to dissect the data. That might be a new direction deserved um, another about another comments on the about the metadata and all of the things we noticed that as no matter how well you document to this, but a lot of the times experiments can can contribute to confounding effects, just basically battery effects. So maybe it's a more is a methodology wise to utilize the biological structure to normalize data is another direction to go because. The, even if you know this data is processing in the same way, but we still can see there's a difference in the, in the results. 
So therefore, knowing the metadata is not enough, then you need to have developed a method such that you utilize the biological structure, the covert structure of the gene expression could be utilized to normalize the different batch effects. So that's what we find potentially is useful. Yeah. I wanted to just, if I could just say quickly um, about this topic theme is, um, and, and, and I had a slide that, that, that alluded to this, um, but you know, there's, there's a good bit of work going on um, in um, precision, this kind of instance specific or patient specific or uh, tissue specific kind of modeling. Um, and I think that uh, in like a lot of areas, there's kind of a, an expansion of people trying different things um, different methods. We had we presented our method, and it has some advantages. Other methods have advantages too. Um, and then there's a synthesis phase. So I think that that's pretty exciting to look at these various methods for doing instance specific biological modeling and figure out ways to combine them into something that's you know more powerful than any one of them together. I don't think we've quite gotten to that, but that's something that I think is very exciting. Um, relatedly. The idea of um, deep neural networks, I think thinking of ways uh, to do instance specific uh, with deep neural networks is a very interesting area. It's obviously challenging, but um, I, I have a, a sense that there's something um, very useful there in, that's, in that research space. So one, one theme that came through, I think, in all three of the talks this morning was the application of machine learning, not just to make predictions, but to gain insight into the biology or disease processes. So I'm interested in hearing your thoughts about um, how, you, how you approach a machine learning problem differently when that is a key goal. So things like taking into account interpretability, of course, but, but what else is there that you need to take into account? Um, yeah, so um, you know, one thing I'd like to comment on that is um, the traditional performance metrics that we report on 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 models is is completely um, orthogonal to many of these use cases we just discussed. Mm -hmm. So, for example, um, we have we have shown, and many others have shown, that you can get incredibly accurate models that are incredibly biased, like they are they are learning high accuracy by focusing on completely trivial things like GC content or assay bias. So just looking at cross-validation or even out of this, you know, whatever, even independent validation set performance metrics for prediction is only half the story. Um, even if you realize your model is not um, necessarily learning biases, the second important point is, is, is stability of, of inferences drawn from it, right? So uh, I showed you some examples of these deep lift scores. It has taken us years to figure out how to stabilize it. Uh, because you can you can do this, and if you change the random seeds, you can get often very different results. And we now have methods that allow you to do that. But uh, training a single model on some fold and then using it for all kinds of inferences is very dangerous because you don't understand the variance in the in interpretation, even though your stability on accuracy looks very high. So I think as a community, we need to uh, focus or at least have standards on uh, also reporting uh, various other kinds of uh, performance metrics on, on the interpretation side of things to show that our models, in fact, are stable and to use best practices that actually help make sure that inferences drawn are robust minimally. Yeah, um, I want to raise two points with respect to this. I think what Anshul described is, is, is really important. I do want to point out that sometimes technical artifacts are very um, consistent between studies. So for example, if you have a, a result that's due to mapping error, you're likely to have the same mapping error in an external study. And so you may see that there's replication when it's really just a complete technical artifact. Uh, and the other thing I want to raise is, is a recent focus in our field on selective inference. So this is a problem in statistics that shows that if you do something like cluster your data and then ask a question about differences between clusters, you're doing post-selection inference. You have, you've inferred something based on your data and then you're, you're specifying your statistical hypothesis in a post-selection manner based on what you've inferred from your data. And this is a problem that we're facing in single cell analysis, but it's, it's broadly applicable to you know, lots of parts of genomics. And so, um, yeah, I guess that's just something that I wanna call people's attention to. And I think that deserves you know, 
uh, I think it's getting increased attention and I think it deserves that increased attention. So both technical artifacts and post-election inference is something that, you know, as a community, we're going to have to face. And can you just spell out what the consequences of post-election? Yeah, so the consequences of post-election inference are basically that you're going to have, you know, very inflated, you know, type one error. <laughs> you're going you're gonna to infer that you have differences when you don't a lot, I guess, is the very, very simple description of what you'll see there. And it is something that we're going to have to take into account. And it's something that I think the network inference community, you know, maybe wasn't paying attention to for a long time. And I think the single cell community is now grappling with um, and, and it is going to be an issue. Mark, if I could quickly uh, reply to your question. I, I think that causal modeling provides insight if, if it's correct. Uh, so um, that's, that's the key. But it, it makes me think of, of, of something that I think would be very useful in, in the theme of this uh, session, which is that it would be great if we had more, we have a lot of observational data, but and we make inferences about what's causal, but then we don't have test of that to know if it's correct. It's not like doing machine learning prediction or classification where you can just do cross validation. You have a hypothesis about what's causal. You need to test it biologically usually. usually. So if there were, if NIH were to provide data sets, could, could sponsor data sets that were observational that then had follow-up with experiments Mm -hmm. then uh, researchers could use those, um, and if they were on the same tissues, use those to uh, test if their causal discovery methods are actually working well. We really need that. Great, great point. Thanks, Greg. So I think we've reached the end of our time, but thank you all for terrific talks and, and a really fascinating discussion. The workshop now has a break for about an hour, and then we'll be back for another session this afternoon. This afternoon for many of us. Thanks, everyone. Bye.